At the peak in 1932 to 1933, 25,000 persons in Ukraine were dying daily, 1,000 every hour, 17 every minute. They died slowly, painfully, often alone. The history of their lives and deaths deliberately concealed. Thank you for joining us in remembering and acknowledging the memory of those who were starved to death during the Holodomor, the famine genocide in Ukraine, 1932 to 1933. This man-made event stands as one of the great tragedies of human history, that its origins, extent, and consequences were deliberately and relatively effectively concealed for many decades constitutes a second heinous crime. This virtual commemoration has been organized by the Holodomor Committee of the United Ukrainian Organizations of Ohio. This presentation has several sections. It begins with a background of conditions that made the Holodomor possible. It then goes on to the actual events of the famine genocide and the suppression of its history. It moves to the early acknowledgement of what happened and then statements from Senator Rob Portman and Congresswoman Marcy Kaptur. The final sections include the current status of acknowledgement and commemoration. Modern Ukraine is by territory the second largest country in Europe after Russia. Blessed with favorable climate, highly productive land, and an industrious people, it became known as the breadbasket of Europe. The eastern regions of Ukraine are rich in iron, coal, and other natural resources. Not surprisingly, Ukraine's territory was highly prized and often forcefully occupied by its neighbors. Following the end of World War I in 1918, three more years of devastating war raged across the territories of Ukraine, involving at various points the armies of Germany, Poland, Russia, anarchists, and the nascent Ukrainian People's Republic. By 1922, Ukraine's territory was partitioned, its westernmost regions governed by Poland, the majority of territory and population falling to the Ukrainian Soviet Socialist Republic, and hence the Soviet Union. As formed in 1922, the Soviet Union consisted of several so-called Soviet Socialist Republics and Federations. These included the Russian, the Transcaucasian, the Ukrainian, and the Belarusian. Although Russians formed the dominant ethnic group, there were significant numbers of other nationalities. The so-called nationalities question, namely how to equitably treat all the peoples of the Soviet Union, remained an unresolved but often debated question. During the 1920s, cultural and language rights of most minorities were fostered, and Ukraine experienced a flowering of schools, culture, and identity. Marxism-Leninism, the founding ideology of Lenin's revolution, demanded a one-party state which controlled all political, economic, and cultural activity. The state would suppress dissent, abolish private property, and impose collectivism. The resulting government would be inherently dictatorial, intolerant, and ready to violate human rights and norms to achieve its ends. Prosperous, hard-working farmers would have no interest in surrendering their lands and livelihoods to the state. Lenin was well aware of this and demonized them from the outset. He referred to these farmers as kulaks, which means fist in Russian, and in no uncertain terms stated his plans for them. Kulaks are the rabid enemy of Soviet rule. We shall wage a merciless war against the Kulaks. Death to them all. 
so-called war communism, the attempt to rapidly and radically transform the market economy to a Marxist one, proved to be ruinous. The state could not provide the basic necessities for its population. This forced Lenin to retreat and adopt the new economic plan, returning light industry, retail, and most importantly agriculture to private ownership and management. In other words, Lenin was compelled to tacitly tolerate the kulaks whom he had previously reviled. After succeeding Lenin, Stalin reversed the new economic plan and embarked on a program of rapid industrialization and militarization. Given the backward state of the Soviet Union, there was a critical need to import goods and services from the West. Stalin's tactical goals were clear. He needed to generate large sums of foreign currency to procure Western equipment and services in support of the five-year plans. These plans favored the proletariat, the urban working class, over the rural population. Full collectivization of agriculture had to be compelled, irrespective of the consequences. Furthermore, he unleashed a campaign against so-called bourgeois nationalism, the Ukrainian cultural renaissance, which Stalin perceived as a mortal threat to his plans. Collectivization required that all resources needed for agriculture, that is manpower, land, livestock, tools and machinery, were to be owned and managed by the state within collective farms. All the output of such collective farms was similarly to become the property of the state. In effect, those who actually worked the land would lose control over their land, their livelihood, and as it turned out, their lives. Individually owned farms dominated the agricultural sector of Ukraine in 1922, much more so than in Russia, where groups of villagers collectively worked the land. Thus, collectivization was foreign to the predominantly ethnic Ukrainian farmers of Soviet Ukraine. They felt a deep connection to their land, were fiercely independent, and believed in individual hard work and the rewards that came with it. In addition, Ukraine had a historical legacy of resistance to impose control. Memory of serfdom, which in the Russian Empire only ended in 1861, remained strong as did a visceral opposition to it. The collectivization campaign had several components. To destroy private ownership and management of the land, the state imposed punitive taxes. The state used its monopoly on fertilizer and machinery to either withhold those from the private sector or demand impossibly high prices. Political agitators and government officials were tasked with reaching collectivization goals. Simple encouragement was followed by social pressure, outright threats, and then violence. Concurrently, the vilification of prosperous farmers as enemies of the people escalated. They were accused of trying to starve their neighbors and thus destroy the Soviet Union. The promotion of such terminology prepared the ground for even more extreme measures. Stalin made his goals explicit. We have changed from a policy of containing the kulaks to a policy of eliminating the kulaks as a class. Affecting millions of Ukrainians, the implementation of this goal amounted to a declaration of war and genocide. Starting in 1930, police and paramilitary began to forcibly confiscate land, homes, and livestock of the most prosperous farmers, who not surprisingly were least interested in joining collective farms. Entire families were thrown out of their homes with little more than the clothes on their back, irrespective of the season. Approximately 20% of the farmers in Soviet Ukraine 
were deported to Central Asia or Siberia. Many were executed. By 1931, over 350,000 individual farms in Soviet Ukraine had been destroyed. The management and work ethic on collective farms was poor, since the most industrious workers were disenfranchised, and the agricultural output no longer belonged to the workers who produced it. Over the years, 1930 to 1933, the gross grain harvest, shown by the black line, declined significantly, but would have been sufficient for the minimal needs of the population, as shown by the red line. However, the Soviet state commandeered an excessive fraction of the harvest. What remained, shown by the blue line, fell by 1931 to 1932 below the levels required for subsistence. If seed stocks needed for planting in the next season were also sequestered, the remainder, shown by the green line, would be insufficient to prevent starvation by the 1931 to 1932 year. Still, collectivization continued. Farmers desperately tried to avoid collectivization. They slaughtered their livestock rather than surrender it. They refused to give up their land. Small, localized armed revolts occurred. The state reacted by forcibly confiscating foodstuffs and livestock. Even collective farms were assigned impossibly high grain quotas. The propaganda machine portrayed rural Ukrainians as wreckers, saboteurs, alien elements who were subhuman. They were compared to vermin or weeds that deserved to be eliminated without mercy. Indeed, the farmers facing state-imposed starvation were accused of causing it. Stanislav Kosyor, the first secretary of the Communist Party of Ukraine, instructed his cadres, the farmers have adopted a new tactic to strangle Soviet rule with the bony hand of starvation. But the enemy has miscalculated. We will show them what a famine really is. You are ordered to collect everything to the last grain and immediately deliver it to the procurement stations. Sevolod Balitsky, the head of the secret police, ordered mobilization of the entire agent network in order to detect hidden concealed grain. All the discovered grain shall be delivered to the state seed depots, which will keep a special record of the delivered grain. Teams of activists, agents, and paramilitary fanned out across villages, searching out even the smallest caches of hidden food. They violently confiscated all foodstuffs from the already starving farmers. In desperation, starving farmers sold whatever family heirlooms they had, typically wedding bands and embroidery. Many tried fleeing to the cities, which were better provisioned. Some tried to flee the workers' paradise entirely. Each of these strategies by farmers to save their lives was quickly recognized and neutralized by the state. For example, special stores were set up where gold rings and embroidery were exchanged for small amounts of flour at exorbitant rates. Villages that could not deliver their grain quotas were considered to be uncooperative and placed on a blacklist. They were surrounded by armed detachments which blocked movement of people and goods. Confinement to a blocked village was akin to a death sentence. Over one-third of villages consisting of about 10 million residents of Soviet Ukraine, were blacklisted. Travel was even further restricted by limiting the sale of railway tickets to prevent the massive exodus of independent farmers and collective farm workers. Borders were reinforced by guards with orders to shoot to kill those attempting to flee. To prevent starving people from taking any grain from the land they previously owned and farmed, the so-called law 
of five grain stalks was introduced. Theft of any grain whatsoever was punishable by death. Buildings where requisitioned grain was stored were guarded by police and paramilitary with orders to shoot to kill. Records show that in the face of massive starvation, Soviet Ukraine exported approximately 1.7 million tons of grain during each of the years 1932 and 1933. That was sufficient grain to forestall any famine. Thus, it is absolutely clear that the famine was not a result of poor harvests. Deprived of food, of the means to produce food, and the ability to move to areas where food was available, Ukrainian farmers starved in increasing numbers. As noted at the outset of this presentation, at the peak, this reached a death rate of 25,000 people per day, 1,000 per hour, or 17 per minute. Despite travel restrictions, some farmers did manage to escape from their villages and try to make their way to cities or regions where they might find food. Most died anyways, on railroad tracks, on roads, and on sidewalks. Kharkiv was one of the largest cities in Soviet Ukraine, and hence one from which we have the most photographs. These show bodies of starved people on sidewalk. Such sites became commonplace for residents of the city. As in most famines, children suffered disproportionately, both due to their physiology and their dependence on others. Estimates are that 30 to 50% of all deaths from starvation were those of children. Overall, one-third of children in Soviet Ukraine were deliberately starved to death. Many farmers, believing the Soviet myth of the all-benevolent socialist state, wrote letters to government officials pleading for assistance. Mikola Rava, a Holodomor survivor, wrote directly to Stalin. His letter was intercepted and preserved by the secret police. Mr. Rava wrote, When starving people were gleaning corn kernels near the storehouse, they were shot like dogs. Cavalry militia troops chased us starving people with unsheathed swords, while grain was in the storehouse. There was grain, and there was flour, but people were dying of starvation, which means it was all done by the government on purpose, and the government knew about it. For this letter, he was imprisoned for six years. Documents show that the whole Holodomor had a dual purpose. One was to collectivize farmers, and the other was to destroy Ukrainian identity. This dual purpose required the Holodomor, the killing by starvation of millions of Ukrainian farmers. Mendel Khatayevich, secretary of the Communist Party of Soviet Ukraine, wrote, There is a violent battle going on between the Ukrainian farmers and our government, a battle to the death. The famine has proved to them who the boss is here. This cost millions of lives, but the collective farm system will exist forever. We won the war. The mass death by starvation inflicted on Ukraine was orchestrated from the highest levels of the Soviet government. Lazar Kaganovich was the Politburo member tasked with implementing collectivization. He instructed his subordinates, your work must be organized and conducted so that the grain procurement quotas are fully executed. You must decisively overcome all in various obstructive attitudes. Pavel Postyshev, the second secretary of the Communist Party of Ukraine, boasted in 1934, 
Last year, we quelled the nationalist counter-revolution, and we routed the Ukrainian nationalist deviancy. Klementy Voroshilov, a top Politburo member, brazenly declared, We consciously opted for the famine, because we needed grain. But those who were victims of the famine were non-working elements and kulaks. Stalin remained at the top of the power vertical. In a later conversation with Winston Churchill, he volunteered his own estimate of the number of deaths during collectivization. The collective farm policy was a terrible struggle. Ten million perished. It was fearful. It was absolutely necessary. Deception and concealment were integral to the Holodomor genocide from its inception. Local officials were ordered to classify deaths from starvation as being due to old age or disease. The authorities seized and destroyed local records of the registry of births and deaths. The census, originally scheduled to take place in 1933, was delayed several times and was finally taken in 1937. The data from that census were not released to the public at that time. Demographers from that period were executed for reporting the truth. Nikita Khrushchev, later the General Secretary of the Communist Party, wrote in his memoirs, I can't give an exact figure because no one was keeping count. All we knew was that people were dying in enormous numbers. What is known is that in 1926, the population of Soviet Ukraine was reported as 31.2 million. The 1933 census was delayed several times. Had the population increase in Soviet Ukraine been comparable to that in other Soviet republics, where there was no famine, by 1937, there should have been 36.5 citizens in Soviet Ukraine. However, the 1937 census reported 26.4 million citizens. In other words, 10.1 million people appear to be missing for the period 1926 through 1937. That time encompasses the Holodomor, but it also includes political purges. Thus, the precise number of those killed by starvation remains to be determined. Estimates range from 4 to 10 million. Local or national Soviet media were not permitted to report on the starvation. Travel to the affected areas of Ukraine, particularly by foreigners, was restricted. When information reached the outside world, the Soviet Union vigorously denied such reports and actively spread disinformation, or what we currently refer to as fake news using loyal sources. Despite the attempted cover-up, stories and photographs did reach the West, and at times became front-page news in the USA and other countries. These front-page stories appeared in mid-level newspapers, the Chicago American in the USA and in the Daily Express in Great Britain. The major newspapers were less willing to address the issue. Gareth Jones was a Welsh journalist and former foreign affairs advisor in the United Kingdom. He was able to spend time in the afflicted areas and recorded his observations. I passed many villages. Everywhere I heard crying. We have no bread. We are dying. Tell England that we are swelling from hunger. On his return to Europe, he gave a press conference and then published his findings in the Manchester Guardian, which left no doubt as to what was happening. His reports drew extensive attention, which the Soviet government found most unwelcome. 
knowing when Gareth Jones' article was to be published, the Soviet government enlisted a trusted journalist, Walter Duranty, to refute Gareth Jones. In an article in the New York Times, published on the same day as Gareth Jones' article, Durante cynically denied the whole of the mod in public, but in private acknowledged to colleagues that millions had perished. However, even the New York Times ran smaller stories about the mass starvation in Soviet Ukraine. We are all dying of starvation, one of the villagers said. They want us to die. It is an organized famine. There has never been a better harvest. But if we were caught cutting a few ears of corn, we would be shot or put in prison and starved to death. Governments around the world knew from their ambassadors, consuls, and other sources what was happening. Indeed, testimony was recorded in proceedings, but the world chose in general to ignore the tragedy and not to react. Political and economic considerations trumped basic human rights. On November 18, 1933, just as the whole of the motto was ebbing, the United States, in the midst of the Great Depression, formally recognized the Soviet Union. American companies profited from contracts to industrialize the Soviet Union. That money was generated by the sale of grain stolen from starving Ukrainian farmers. The 20th century then delivered other tragedies, the horrors of World War II, including the Holocaust, the first use of atomic weapons, revolution in China, the Cold War, the territories of Ukraine, where the Holodomor raged, remained under Soviet control, the archives remained closed, and the famine was officially ignored by the Soviet government. The death by starvation was not forgotten, however, by Ukrainians and allies who had fled to the West. In response to lobbying by Ukrainian-American citizens, in 1984, the 98th Congress established the United States Commission on the Ukraine Famine. The commission was chaired by the accomplished historian Dr. James Mace and submitted its report on April 22, 1988. The key findings were the victims of the Ukrainian famine numbered in the millions. Official Soviet allegations of Kulak sabotage upon which all difficulties were blamed during the famine, are false. The famine was not, as is often alleged, related to drought. Joseph Stalin and those around him committed genocide against Ukrainians in 1932 to 1933. The American government had ample and timely information about the famine, but failed to take any steps which might have ameliorated the situation. Scholarly works such as The Harvest of Sorrow by Robert Conquest appeared contemporaneously and drew heavily on the work of Dr. James Mace and the Commission's findings. The 108th U.S. Congress accepted the Commission's findings, additionally observing, whereas Although the Ukraine famine was one of the greatest losses of human life in the 20th century, it remains insufficiently known in the United States and in the world. To increase awareness of the Holodomor, Congress authorized that federal land in Washington, D.C. be provided for the establishment of a memorial. Such a memorial was raised in our nation's capital and is now the site of services and commemorations. While many of our elected leaders came together in a bipartisan way to support the raising of awareness of the Holodomor, the efforts of the Senate Ukraine Caucus and of the Congressional Ukraine Caucus 
in the U.S. Congress need to be noted. In this regard, two leaders from Ohio have played an outsized role. We now present messages from Senator Rob Portman and from Congresswoman Marcy Kaptur. I'm U.S. Senator Rob Portman, and I'm honored to join the great Ukrainian-American community in Ohio in commemorating the Holodomor, the intentional starvation of large segments of Ukrainian society from 1932 to 1933 by the Soviet Union under Joseph Stalin. It was one of the greatest atrocities of the 20th century. Most international experts agree that the Holodomor was a genocidal event that caused at least several million deaths, one that remains unacknowledged by Russia today. The Holodomor was a key pillar of the Soviets' brutal strategy to break Ukraine as a nation, defeat its push for greater self-rule or outright independence, and ensure their full submission to Moscow's rule. Ultimately, this atrocity failed to break the will of the Ukrainian people. And today, Ukraine is vibrant, free, independent, and a strong democracy. In recent years, we have seen progress in recognizing this tragedy in the form of a number of congressional actions to condemn the Holodomor and honor its victims, including the 2015 dedication of the memorial in Washington, D.C. In 2018, as the co-founder and co-chair of the Senate Ukraine Caucus, I was proud to lead the passage of a bipartisan resolution marking the 85th anniversary of the Holodomor. This important resolution honored the memory of the millions of Ukrainians who suffered under Stalin's cruelty. Ukraine continues to fight to this day to defend its independence and its sovereignty in the face of Russian aggression. And this annual recognition of the atrocities that occurred in the 30s serves as an important reminder of the perseverance of a people whose spirit cannot be broken. I thank the United Ukrainian Organizations of Ohio and all the members of the Ukrainian American community for their commitment to preserving this atrocity in our public memory so that we may remain vigilant to ensure such evil never happens again. Thank you. I hope to see you soon. And Godspeed. Hello, I'm Congresswoman Marcy Kaptur, representing Ohio's 9th Congressional District along the southern shores of Lake Erie. As co-chair of the bipartisan Congressional Ukraine Caucus, I wish to join Ukrainian Americans across northern Ohio in commemorating the memory of millions of Ukrainians who died in the Holodomir famine genocide. As you well know, Ukraine suffered greatly from Soviet oppression. Under the tyrannical rule of Joseph Stalin, the Soviet Union took complete control of Ukraine's precious, fertile lands. In 1932 and 33, it forced the starvation of more than 7 million innocents, literally a man-made, engineered famine, to feed the cruel and murderous Soviet dictatorship to strike fear and submission among the population. While the Soviet Union and some in the West attempted to sweep this atrocity under the rug, I helped to lead efforts to seek historical truth. This included creating a congressional commission in 1986 to document the Holodomir, releasing previously withheld U.S. government documents related to it, and ultimately in 2015, the unveiling of the Holodomir Memorial in Washington, D.C. The world must know the truth for its own sake and to never, ever again allow such horrendous atrocities to take root anywhere. And that is why I am so thankful to the Holodomir Committee and the United Ukrainian Organizations of Ohio for their leadership to uncover and reveal the historical truth. It is our duty as liberty-loving people to continue our work, to help fellow citizens across our region and country remember. Remember the Ukrainian people's sacrifice through promoting Holodomir studies in school curricula, academic research, political proclamations, local memorials, and so much more. Currently, the Congressional Ukraine Caucus remains committed to advocate for robust assistance to provide Ukraine the support it needs to further deter Russia's continued aggression and war against Ukraine, now the scrimmage line for liberty on the European continent. With your critical engagement, I know Ukraine will continue its trajectory among the community of democracies and rid itself of Russian malign influence once and for all. To that end, we commit our generation so as to inspire those who will follow. 
Thank you all very much. Slava, Ukraina. With the collapse of the Soviet Union, the government of newly independent Ukraine has been able to investigate the Holodomor more extensively through interviews of survivors as well as examination of previously secret archives. Memorials have been raised in Kyiv and across many cities in Ukraine. Of course, the Ukrainian diaspora around the world had already engaged in such a campaign, which continues to the present day. Indeed, Ukrainian Americans from coast to coast also raised memorials to the victims of Holodomor. Organizations, museums, and research consortia have been developed around the world to evaluate and raise awareness of the Holodomor. In the Cleveland, Ohio area, our community assembles regularly at the memorials at Holy Trinity, Ukrainian Orthodox Church in North Royalton, and St. Vladimir's Ukrainian Orthodox Church in Parma, which also maintains a memorial room. During the month of November, designated for Holodomor Remembrance in Ukraine and around the world, our communities gather at the memorials and participate in a service, or panacheda, for the repose of the souls of the deceased. Such an ecumenical service was conducted recently by the Ukrainian-American clergy of Northeast Ohio at the Holy Trinity Ukrainian Orthodox Church in North Royalton. Due to the pandemic, our community could not participate in person. However, the entire service, along with remarks from Most Reverend Bohdan Danilo, the Bishop of the Ukrainian Catholic Eparchy of St. Josephette in Parma, was recorded and can be accessed through the link provided in the invitation to our presentation. Students at heritage schools of Ukrainian studies, such as the several that operate in the Cleveland area, learn about the Holodomor in their curriculum and through participation in commemorations. Photographs and accompanying audio recordings from a recent commemoration by students of the Cleveland School of Ukrainian Studies in Parma can be accessed through the link provided in the invitation to our presentation. We work with our elected officials at all levels of government so that proclamations are regularly issued recognizing the whole de mort as a genocide. This slide shows such a meeting from pre-pandemic times between representatives of our Ukrainian-American community of Ohio and the then governor, the distinguished John Kasich. The Ukrainian Museum Archives in Cleveland houses rare periodicals from the time of and materials about the Holodomor. It remains an invaluable resource for scholars. Growing scholarship about Holodomor continues to expand our knowledge of what happened, why it happened, and what the consequences have been. There are, as might be expected, those who deny the Holodomor. The oldest and crudest strategy is to deny the famine altogether, or to claim that if it did occur, it was minor. Mounting evidence has thoroughly discredited those claims. Another approach is to claim that any famine was unintentional, resulting from a combination of mismanagement and poor harvests. Directives from the Soviet state and data on grain exports refute such claims. A continuing claim is that the famine was not unique to Soviet Ukraine. Scholarship shows, however, that the combination of features such as blacklisting, restriction of mobility, and high grain quotas, which maximize mortality, were indeed concentrated on the territory of Ukraine and were focused on the rural, ethnically Ukrainian population. Yet another claim is that even though many died, the Holodomor 
does not meet all the legal criteria for being recognized as a genocide. That view is not widely shared. The Russian Federation, however, which considers itself the successor of the Soviet Union, has consistently denied the Holodomor and its genocidal reality. It is worth underscoring that the term genocide was coined by Raphael Lemkin, a legal scholar who fled his native Poland and settled in the United States. He lectured about genocide and wrote about the Soviet genocide in Ukraine. We remain grateful to the many countries who have recognized the Holodomor for what it was, a genocide against the Ukrainian nation. This truth has also been recognized by the United States Congress and by many individual states. Our work, however, continues. The Holodomor Committee of the United Ukrainian Organizations of Ohio Thank you for your attention and support for the continuing scholarship and raising of awareness about the Holodomor. This presentation has drawn heavily on many sources of material, and in particular on the excellent exhibit, Holodomor, Genocide by Famine, organized by the League of Ukrainian Canadians in cooperation with the Museum of Soviet Occupation of the KU Memorial Society in Ukraine and the League of Ukrainian Canadian Women.